Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to present on behalf of Science Therapeutics this evening uh, and to tell you a little bit about um, the work that we do. A um, bit of a shift, shift in gear. So this is a, a biotech company. We're AIM listed. And we're uh, an RNA interference um, biotech company. Uh, so my name is Rob Quinn. I'm currently the CFO of Silence. Um, I started out life as a scientist. I trained as a, a biochemist, a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Manchester. And then I had an epiphany. And I retrained as an accountant. Uh, so not a path taken by too many scientists. Um, but I've worked in th throughout my, my um, education and career. I've worked across uh, M&A, commercial finance, research, manufacturing, and now as CFO. And I guess all of that experience has brought me here today um, to work on a, 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 a central passion of mine. And that passion is bringing new innovative drugs to patients. Now, I joined Silence Therapeutics about two years ago. Um, and in that time, we've been on a challenging and but exciting journey um, to take um, our lead drug asset, um, which is called SLM124, uh, to the clinic. Um, and I'm really proud to be able to um, talk a little bit tonight about that asset and, and it being on the verge of entering the clinic very shortly. Um, so, the, so some of us here um, will already be investors in silence. And, and for you, I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you some of the recent data, and I'm going to give you an update on all of our, um, all of our exciting programs. Um, some of you may never have heard of silence. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a kind of high-level overview of the technology, our people, uh, and some of our key programs. Um, so the talk is structured in three parts. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to the company, the technology, the people. I'm going to talk about the three programs. So one for iron overload disorder, one for cardiovascular disease, and one for complement-mediated disease. And then I'm going to summarize and tell you a little bit about the key news flow uh, over the next um, short-term period. And so with that, I'll, I'll start. Um, so Silence is, a, is an RNA interference company. So the central dogma of biology says that um, DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and an RNA gets translated into protein. So proteins are, as many of you know, are the workhorse of your body. So your heart, muscle, your hair, your skin, everything that your body does is largely driven by proteins. Now, most small molecules and most antibodies target proteins. So that's how they affect their, their, their work. Um, some of the new gene therapy and gene editing uh, technologies, they try and address the DNA itself. So they go to the, the heart of, of the problem. We work in the middle, so we work on the RNA, so the middleman in that DNA, RNA, protein journey. And what we do is we, we suppress the expression of RNA. So in a disease state, if you've got an elevated level of RNA causing trouble, usually through the protein, what we do is we specifically and transiently dampen down that RNA expression. So Silence is based in, in, in the UK, in London, uh, but also in, in Berlin, Germany. Uh, we have about 50 people. Um, we have our research facility in Berlin, um, and we have corporate and clinical development activities here in London. Um, we were founded um, about 20 years ago, um, and, and have been on, on listed on AIM for a number, number of years. Our key um, lead program is called SLM124, and it addresses iron overload disorders. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that asset. Um, but most importantly, I'm going to describe how we plan to take it into the clinic uh, and to treat patients in the coming months. Uh, we also have a second asset for uh, cardiovascular disease. And also, uh, I'm going to disclose this evening uh, an asset for complement-mediated diseases, which we just announced uh, just, just last week. Uh, we have a strong management team, so uh, a clear kind of R&D expertise, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll share some of those names with you. Um, and as of the, the 31st of December 2018, we had $35 million or £27 million on the, on the balance sheet. Um, and that is, uh, that is sufficient to fund us into the second half of next year, uh, which will allow us to read out clinical data for this key SLM124 Phase 1B trial. So some of the, the key highlights for 2018 from Silence. Um, so as I mentioned, our, our lead asset, um, SLM124, it was granted orphan drug designation by the European Medicines Agency. So this gives us certain benefits around exclusivity upon commercialization, and it gives us certain tax benefits. Um, it, 
it, it basically acknowledges the fact that there are a, a small pool of patients um, for beta thalassemia in, in Europe. Uh, we will file a clinical trial application very soon. Um, a clinical trial application is the, the first step in, in starting a clinical trial. Uh, the trial will start um, a, a, a couple of months uh, thereafter. And as it says, uh, the first patient will be expected in that trial in the second half of 2019. Uh, we've started uh, the main bulk of the preparatory work for SLN 360, which is a cardiovascular medicine. And, and all of that work um, over the next uh, 12 to 15 months will enable us to then start a clinical trial with that program in 2020. We have out-licensed our technology to a company called Quark Pharmaceuticals. Um, Quark has two phase three assets that use our technology. And they have uh, Novartis, uh, the big pharmaceutical company, has an option to license um, those Quark assets. If they do so, um, Silences um, can enjoy 15% um, royalty uh, based on, on any economics coming to Quark. We have a new CEO, uh, David Horn Solomon, joined us in July 2018 and brings a wealth of public company biotech experience. And I'll share with you the, the broader team in a moment. We announced in December that we settled a license and um, a license agreement with Alnylam Pharmaceuticals. Alnylam Pharmaceuticals, we were um, litigating Alnylam for patent infringement, um, but that case was re resolved and, and Silence enjoys a, a tiered royalty on the net sales of Onpatro. Onpatro is the first silencing RNA medicine to be approved, and it was approved last year. So, so Onpatro is, is at the, the forefront of the field, but we are we are coming along behind it. Um, I won't dwell uh, too much on the, on the financial highlights, but I will share with you a, a, a P&L um, near the end of the slides. Um, I'll quickly um, move to the team. So you'll see a lot of us at Silence in the management team are, are recent joiners. Um, and that reflects, I guess, our transition from more of a technology focus historically to real drug development focus uh, right this moment. And, and I think that's typified by um, our VP of clinical development here who, who just joined us in September, clearly, uh, to take us into the clinic. <coughs> so I spoke about DNA going to RNA, going to protein, and I spoke about silence knocking down the RNA expression. So we do that using an oligonucleotide. So the RNA itself is made of an oligonucleotide. An oligonucleotide is just a building block. It's a, it's a long word for a building block. What we do, though, is we match that building block perfectly. So when our drug goes into the cell, it matches complete, uh, uh, perfectly, uh, and then the expression of that target is, is dampened down. Now, how do we get into the cell? So that's the magic here is around this, this bullseye, uh, which is, which is a, a, chem, a chemical structure called a galnac, and it's a simple sugar, effectively. But this simple sugar allows specific cells in the liver to selectively take up our drug. So that's why we call our drug we, we say it has specificity upon specificity. So the sequence itself only binds to the sequence it's after. And the galnac is only taken up by hepatocyte cells. So we can very selectively get to genes being expressed in the, in the hepatocyte. Um, it's patient friendly, so subcutaneous delivery. So um, a needle, an auto injector needle uh, that patients could administer themselves. And the dosing is infrequent. So we're talking about monthly or perhaps even quarterly dosing here. Uh, you know, in comparison to, you know, some drugs on the market might be intravenously every, every few days, or um, I'll show you in a moment about the, the frequency of transfusions that some of the patients were um, looking to, to help um, uh, suffer from. <clears throat> so this is our pipeline. So SLM124 will enter the clinic this year. And SLM124 targets two major indications in the first instance. One is beta thalassemia. So it's a, a relatively rare disease, um, but about 60,000 patients across the US and Europe. And myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a, a bigger indication, but still relatively rare, um, about 100,000 patients across the EU and, and, and US. There are many more indications we can go into with SLM124. Um, it is really a potentially a mechanistic approach to dampen down any iron overload disorder, and there are several iron overload disorders. I'll talk a little bit about SLN 360, and that's for cardiovascular disease, and I'll also talk about complement-mediated disease, but we also have several um, earlier stage undisclosed programs, uh, which I won't go into this evening. And as you can see, whilst 
our proprietary in-house programs are largely early stage, i.e. just entering into the clinic. Um, our two out-licensed programs that Quark have are, um, are, are approaching commercialis commercialization in, in phase three each. So I'll spend a few minutes on SLM 124. So this is the key program entering the clinic shortly. You can see the number of patients and these patients typically have blood transfusions every, as frequently as every two weeks if, if you are very severely impacted. And with that comes infection risk and, it, and it's a massive patient burden. Now alongside, so, so with that transfusion comes a high iron bolus. So these patients are getting a huge amount of iron into their blood. So in order to combat that, they use a drug called chelators, and the chelators soak up the iron. But they do very little to take the iron in the, um, in the, in the organs, and the iron builds up over time. So this is an issue. Aside from the patient burden, it's, it's a massive issue in terms of secondary iron, iron buildup. So SLM, SLM124 aims to both reduce organ iron levels. So if you get transfusion, you're probably still going to have to take chelators, but we're addressing the, the organ iron levels more directly. And importantly though, and most importantly, we aim to enhance erythropoiesis. So we aim to boost the generation of red blood cells. So if you're making more red blood cells, you need less red blood cell transfusions. So this vicious cycle of transfusions is, uh, is hoped to be dampened down by our drug. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the biology, but I'll just take you across the kind of summary level view here. So when we silence this gene, it's called Timpra 6, but that's less important. We silence it, so it goes down. When it goes down, another gene called hepcidin goes up. So Timpra's down, hepcidin up. And when hepcidin is increased, the iron levels are decreased. And there's a couple of biological mechanisms that drive this, but um, that's the, the simplistic story. We're also improving, improving uh, erythropoiesis, and by doing that, we're reducing anemia and reducing iron overload. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide just to, just to illustrate the, the biological mechanism of action and then I'll, I'll, I'll whiz more quickly through the, the rest of the data slides. So this is an experiment in healthy mice. So this is, I guess, the first step in, in, um, in drug development. So you, we give the mice our drug at this concentration, three mg per kilogram, and we look at the mice after one week, three weeks, and six weeks. So this is measuring that mRNA. So ignore the M part, but it's measuring the, the RNA that I spoke about that we're trying to dampen down. So this is the, the control. So this is the level of RNA in the untreated mice. And then when you treat them with our drug, very, very rapidly, you see a, about 90 to 95% knockdown in the RNA. Now you follow that for three weeks and it starts to build up a little bit. And then you follow it for six weeks and it's building up a little bit more, but you can still see a sustained knockdown after six weeks. Now, that RNA is kind of irrelevant in this whole scheme. What we're trying to do is reduce iron levels. So let's have a look at the iron levels. So these are the iron levels in untreated mice. And here you see, after a week after treatment with our drug, you can see, what, about a 40% reduction in iron levels. So the kinetics are slower. So it's not quite as rapid as the, RNA, as the, the mRNA, but nonetheless it's powerful. And, and uh, we would expect a, a lag um, just through the biological mechanism. And you can see then after three weeks you get a further reduction in iron levels. And then you can see after six weeks it starts to pick up again. So this would point towards a, a roughly monthly dosing schedule. Um, so this tells a similar story, except in this case we're looking at one time point, but we're looking at two different dosing levels. So here you've got untreated, then you treat with one mg per kg. Remember the last experiment had three mg per kg. This is one mg per kg. And you get this reduction, but then you get a further reduction with three mg per kg. So this is a dose-dependent uh, response. And, and dose dependency is, is, is what you would expect to see if your drug is working correctly. Then you see a dose-dependent increase in hepcidin, and you see a dose-dependent decrease in serum iron levels. But really, crucially in this experiment, we looked at kidney iron levels. So this is, this is iron in, your, in the serum. This is iron actually in the kidney organ. And you can see while at one, one mg per kg you don't really see a reduction, 
at the higher dose you do after this three week period and that's really significant for these patients and, and these I should have said these mice are uh, they're diseased mice they uh, have a um, a disease model for hereditary hemochromatosis which is an iron overload uh, disorder I'm going to skip through this slide in the interest of time so we've we've got some really robust preclinical data so that's given us the um, uh, the comfort to take this through into the clinic and, and that clinical, asset, uh, clinical trial will start later this year. So it's a two-part trial. So it's in, it's in patients. So oftentimes phase one trials are in healthy volunteers. This is in patients. We're going to look at beta thalassemia patients in the part A and we're going to gradually increase the dose of SLN 124 And then in the part B, we're going to look at myelodysplastic and beta thalassemia patients and we're going to look at multiple doses. And these trials run over the course of starting later this year into 2021. So in summary on SLM124, I've shown you robust preclinical data. We are ready to start the trial. We have all our, our regulatory filings in the process of, of being, being filed. We believe we have a commercially successful positioning um, with a, uh, a monthly or less frequent dosing in a patient-friendly manner. And all of the conversations we've had with regulators thus far have been positive. And clearly, we, we have had many of those conversations as we've as we brought the asset through. So I'm going to talk about our second asset now, which is SLM360, which is for cardiovascular disease. So SLM360 targets something else. So it targets this, pro this protein called LP little a. So LP little a, the biological function is a little bit unclear. But what we do know is that when you have increased levels of LP little a in your blood, you've got a much higher risk of getting um, cardiovascular disease. And that's actually independent of typical risk factors. So you might, you might not smoke, you might not ha have high blood pressure, you might not have diabetes. But if you have high LP little a levels, you are at a, you know, at a, a, much, increased level, a much increased risk of getting cardiovascular disease. It's a high unmet need. Um, there is a treatment out there which basically filters um, the serum. It takes all the lipids out. And obviously, there's many good lipids. You don't want to take them all out. But that is how people treat LP little a at the moment. And it's very invasive and burdensome. So you're sitting there for two hours as, as this machine filters your, your blood. So we know, we know that LP little a causes disease, cardiovascular disease. On the flip side, when humans have a loss of function mutation, so when they don't express LP little a, there's no sign of any ill, 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 Ill health. So, so we're, we're, we're not worried that knocking down LP little a in the long term will have any negative effect. So this is the data. So we only released this just, just last Monday. And this experiment is in non-human primates. So in drug development, it is uh, critical that before you go into humans, you do test your drug in higher organisms. You, you can't do all of that in mice. You do need to, to move forward. Um, and. Uh, one of these models is a synomalgous monkey. So these monkeys are, are given uh, three different doses of the drug, and they're followed for two months. So this is the control. So this is the LP little a levels, and it's a little bit variable, as you would expect. And these are the three different groups that are given the three different concentrations. And you can see, rapidly, you get a knockdown in LP little a levels, down to about 90%. And you see that impressively right over the course of the two month time period. Now we stopped the experiment after 63 days, so we actually don't know yet how long this will run. And, but clearly um, there is uh, much left to run in this. Uh, so in summary, um, LP little a, we're, we're doing the hard work right now to prepare for a clinical trial. Uh, we're preparing what's called a, a clinical trial application or an investigational new drug application. Um, that will come in the, sec in the second half of 2020. Um, but that work is, is underway right now. And we believe this drug compares really um, positively against competitors. <coughs> and finally, complement-mediated diseases. And I'm not going to dwell too much on this, um, but needless to say, this is a, a very exciting disease area. There are a lot of, there's a lot of unmet need. Um, our early preclinical work, this is in healthy mice. Again, you see the same patterns I've shown already. Uh, significant knockdown um, quite rapidly. And this is a little bit earlier, but, um, but being taken through the, the preclinical pipeline. <clears throat> I'm going to go a little bit into my question time, but just to summarize. 
Uh, so these are our annual reports, for, uh, annual results for 2018. We just um, issued these last Monday. Um, we're a pre-revenue company, uh, as you will probably have guessed by now. Um, we spend um, about eight to 10 million pounds on R&D. And you can see that increase, 22% increase in 2018, and that's driven by investing in our pipeline. The, 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 cloud, the, the further assets get and you bring them into the clinic, the more expensive it becomes. Um, we spent about six and a half million on GNA in 2017. Last year we spent 10.8. That is uh, exceptional. We have uh, a one-off cost in terms of that litigation that I spoke about that we, we had with Al Nylum. That has all, be, all been resolved and you, we will expect to see administration expenses come down again uh, for 2019. Uh, so in summary, and some of the major news flow and company milestones uh, coming up. So as I said, SLM124, exciting. It's gonna enter the clinic this year. We're gonna file that regulatory document uh, and we're gonna dose it in humans in the, first, in the second half of 2019. We expect those earlier results to become available in 2020. SLM 360 sorry, is a little bit further behind, but as I said, we'll be preparing for the clinic and getting ready for that in 2020. And some of these earlier targets are progressing nicely towards the clinic as well. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm around for the, this evening and I'd love to hear um, any further questions aside from the questions that we're going to have now for the next few minutes, but do come and find me um, at the drinks reception. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Lovely. Rob, thank you very much. Do you have any questions for Rob? Any hands up? I, I wanted to understand the, um, the, the, the trial better the, for the SLN124. Um, so hoping to start it this year, What's the, what would be the size of the trial? Um, how many patients would you be looking for? Um, and then how long would that trial last? Mm -hmm. And then, then further to that, when would you be able to start commenting on what the results of that would be? Sure, sure. So it's a, so it's a phase 1B trial. So typically in clinical development, you get phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. So it's a phase 1B trial. So a phase 1B trial effectively is skipping the phase 2 part. So we anticipate running this trial and then moving straight into the last trial before commercialization. So there's 72 patients in the phase 1B trial. Uh, it'll run over the course of the um, uh, second half of this year, 2020 and 2021. Uh, we'll have the final results uh, late 2021 and be expecting to then start the next phase in 2022. Uh, again, that's a phase three trial, uh, much bigger numbers of patients, so perhaps you know several hundred patients. Um, that's probably a two to three year um, timeline. Uh, with launch expected in 2025, 2026. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a long journey, and that, but that is that is the nature of, of, of clinical development. And how, how is the drug administered? So it's subcutaneously injected. So it's a um, like an insulin pen for those who who, who know or are aware of that. So it's a uh, an, an auto injector pen uh, injected in your in your abdomen actually, um, but pretty um, you know pretty quick and and, and quite. Pain free. So would people on the trial have to come in and have that administered by a nurse or a doctor? Would they be able to do that at home themselves? No. So, so in, in clinical development, all, all of this will happen in a clinic. So n none of this would happen at home just yet. Um, but the, the patients would be very monitored very closely to make sure. And there are lots of measurements taken to make sure their uh, safety is the, the, the preeminent um, uh, you know, objective with a phase one trial. A question here, please. Hi. Um, I'm looking at Stockopedia and their figures, I presume, are Morningstar figures, and they're showing revenue of 20 million in 2019 and 54 million in 2020. Mm. Is some of this revenue coming from the Quark deal, or are those numbers reasonable forecasts? So, so Quark is the, is the short-term revenue driver for, for silence. So clearly, I've just said 2025, 2026 for our, our in-house um, assets. Um, Quark has a, Novartis have an option with Quark. Um, there is a, we believe, quite a large option fee if they take that option. And it's been publicly disclosed that there's, I think, $625 million of milestones potentially due to Quark if they successfully commercialize the assets, mm -hmm. as well as you know, royalties, et cetera, once, they're, once, they're, uh, once it's on sale. So, so in simple terms, we would be eligible for 15% of any Quark milestones. Now, that is not... You know, I'm not guiding anybody on that. That is, you know, that is clearly, and we, we're not privy to any information that, that Quark have. 
Um, but it is a clear upside for solids. Has there been any work done on or, or um, analysis um, by any analyst on the on Patro, the royalty income that you might mm -hmm. be due? Any figures in the public domain on that? Yeah, so I think um, you know you're talking kind of in the order of several hundred thousand to to, to low low single millions. Um, the the patent the, the royalty applies to EU sales of Onpatrum, uh, uh, net sales of Onpatrum, um, and the royalty rate is zero point three three to one percent. So, I think that's the, those, those levels of figures have, have been in, in the public domain. Question here, thank you. Um, I presume the half life of the molecule is very short. Is that true in the blood? It is. It is quite rapid. Yeah. So. How on earth can you decide the dosing when you, you can't measure it? So you don't really know, you know how much is still in the tissue. Mm. I, mean, I know you have the animal data, but as we know, men aren't necessarily like mice or even like monkeys. So mm. how on earth do you decide what the, dose, the optimal dose is? Well, so the, so the half-life of the drug is, is quite short. But the effect of the drug is quite long, as, as you can clearly yeah. see. Um, so so you're, you're measuring that PD, um, that, that, that drug effect, um, over time. And we, we obviously start at a very low dose. We wouldn't expect to see any effect. And as we ramp up the dosage levels, we will very closely monitor those patients okay. to, see, to see that impact. So you'll keep on going up the doses until you see an effect? effect yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? On the cardiovascular, uh, slightly uh, longer term, but um, kind of potential size of the market, you um, didn't give any numbers on and who might be affected by uh, that condition, the LP little a. What, what do you think that could be? So, so the market for LP little a, high LP little a is relatively ill-defined. There's no products on the market for the LP little a se segment of um, the cardiovascular disease market. Clearly, the cardiovascular disease market is, you know, the numbers are, are silly. We're, we're, you know, it's tens, tens of billions of, of pounds. Um, the market for LPLA LA is really there to be, uh, to be, to be defined more closely. So, you know, the, the, the broad genetic screening for LPLA LA hasn't, hasn't as yet happened. Um, many, there may be many of us who are potential carriers of LPLA LA, we just don't know it yet. Mm. And, and some of the broad kind of genetic screening programs that will be rolled out over the next, you know, years will, 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 will I think, you know, unearth some, some high LPLA LA carriers. Um, our numbers clearly, you know, even based on a, on a small subsegment segment of the market, you're talking kind of single billion dollars of, of, of market um, potentially available for this asset. And the kind of final one for me, in terms of the, the technology side, mm -hmm. um, if you've got something with the, with the RNA um, suppression, how, how can, you, can you license the technology? Can, can, can other third parties, can, can they take that and use that for other conditions in other areas? Mm -hmm. would, would, would that be a, a more direct way of getting more people using this technology and more revenue for the company? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I and mean, we're obviously open to, to, to partnership conversations. Um, it is a platform technology. So in theory, if you, you know, any company can come to us with a target that they've identified. If it's expressed in the liver, um, we, can, we can likely um, silence it. Um, so, so we obviously do have those types of conversations on a regular basis. Um, there's, you know, there's, no, there's nothing to disclose, but that's certainly a, certainly a potential um, upside here and, and a near-term revenue generator. Any final questions? All right, then, Rob, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.